Welcome everyone uh, to our November pull up a seat. Uh, we are so glad to have you here with us today. We have a um, great conversation lined up for you. Um, thank you for those who, who participated in the No More Disparities conversation that we had um, last week. And um, this is going to be our last pull up a seat for the year. Um, we've decided since December is likely going to be, you know, holidays and people are getting ready that we will kick back off in January full swing and also honoring our West Coasters who have said that they would love to participate, but 6 a.m. is a little early for them. <laughs> so we will think we will sort of likely put the time a little bit further so that we can have um, our audience participate across the country. Um, so thank you for um, coming and we are going to get started. Today, we, this is our agenda for the day. Um, I'm, well, I welcomed you all, going to have introductions. I'm going to um, ask, uh, well, introductions, let me introduce myself first. <laughs> My name is Shonda Cooper. I am the Diversity and Inclusion Manager here at Tiger Lily Foundation. And um, we have a dynamic group of women and a dynamic gentleman who is going to be our keynote today. And I would just ask for them to briefly introduce themselves and then um, we will continue with the agenda. Starting with um, the first person I see is Tova. Hi, good morning. Happy Friday, everyone. My name is Tova Parker. I reside in uh, Spring, Texas, um, a suburb of Houston, Texas by way of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I was diagnosed with stage three invasive ductive, ductal carcinoma, uh, stage three breast cancer, um, triple negative last year, one week before Christmas. Um, I, since then I've had uh, five months of chemo and three surgeries this year, three, about four weeks ago, I just had my reconstructive surgery. And so I'm currently in recovery from that. Um, during my organization, I reached out to try to find, um, women that look like me to, pro to provide hope and give inspiration, uh, to my journey. And, um, I found these, uh, organizations much later in my journey. So since I didn't have, um, have access to them at the time, uh, I started to blog my experience uh, very transparently at prettysick.com so that the person, the next person that come behind me would not have the experience that I have where that they did, they felt like they were alone in their journey. I'm happy to be here and thank you for inviting me to join the panel discussion this morning. Thank you, Tova. We're so delighted to have you here. Um, it's pretty sick that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> here. I saw what you did there, Shonda. <laughs> um, <laughs> such a nerd um so we're gonna have um, lakeisha Red hi. oh sorry hi my name is lakeisha i am from new york long island um i am 41 i was originally diagnosed in 2011 with an early stage stage one and then last year i was re-diagnosed Metastatic. I am also the co-founder of Pink Shoes Inc., which is a nonprofit breast cancer organization that provides assistance to women battling breast cancer. Thank you for having me. Hey, thank you for joining us. Um, Latalia Palmer. Good morning, everybody. I'm Latalia Palmer. Uh, just thank you for having me again, first of all. I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to share and to just be a part of this fantastic panel. Um, I don't know if I've recovered from last week. <laughs> it was so mm -hmm. powerful. But um, I was diagnosed with stage three inflammatory breast cancer, triple negative, that um, by the time I was diagnosed, it had um, cut through my, uh, what's that muscle? It's the big muscle behind your breast. I can't think of it now. Um, uh, invaded my lymph nodes and, um, I had a huge 12 centimeter lump on my breast. And so I, um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here because I want to help spread awareness. I want to help people understand that it's important to be in tune with their bodies and advocate for themselves so that they can be heard throughout this journey. So again, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us, Latalia and uh, Nadia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nadia Smith, based out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, originally from Mississippi. Um, I was diagnosed with ductal carcinoma in C2 at the age of 33 in March of 2016. 
Um, I went on to have radiation therapy, breast reconstruction, 25 rounds of radiation therapy, um, breast reconstruction. Um, and as we discussed on our previous call, um, I was very, um, very active, very healthy. So it was hard for me, as Tova mentioned, to find that support group. Like I didn't, I didn't see anyone that looked like me in the doctor's offices, you know, in any of the material that I was provided or on any of the websites, you know, that I was sent to for reference. Um, and so after, you know, taking that transition from getting through the day to day to surviving, um, I wanted to make sure that other young women, um, especially women of color, did not feel like me along that journey. It was about two years in before I really started to find organizations um, that supported um, that supported young women of color that were impacted by breast cancer. So my advocacy has started and I'm glad to be here. Super excited. I'm not on the West Coast, but it is a little earlier for me. <laughs> um, but like rolled out of bed, excited, like let's do this. So very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, um, Nadia. Uh, let me remove this. Okay. Okay, and I we also have Sean Johnson, who I will introduce um, before his keynote. Um, Sean Johnson, welcome, and yes, I'll introduce you um, a little right before you speak. Uh, so we, I just wanted to give you an update. Okay, so these are the lovely ladies that you just heard from. Um, Tova Parker, Nadia Smith, Lakeisha Gordon. Oh, Tammy, Tammy, please. I'm so, sorry. I'm so glad I looked at this. Tammy, last but certainly not the least, Tammy, please. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Tammy. I am from Nigeria, born in Ohio, and I live in Florida. Um, I was diagnosed with delta carcinoma in C2 at the age of 22. Um, and I went through a double mastectomy. I am currently going through reconstruction. Um, and I'm really passionate about public health advocacy, um, breast cancer awareness, and genetics. Thank you, Tammy. You're and welcome. Yes, so glad to have you here. Um, okay, so we are um, the five agreements, how to be in conversation. Okay, uh, monitor your airtime, speak your truth, speak from your own experience, um, speak from your own experience, lead with curiosity and not judgment, and keep, please keep the, safe, the space safe. Our why. Our why is to educate, um, advocate for, empower, and support young women um, before, during, and after breast cancer. We envision a future where breast cancer diagnosis doesn't inspire uh, fear, but it ignites hope and a future. Since March of 2019, in collaboration with our strategic partners and IRIS Collaborative, the Tiger Lily Foundation has reached more than 200 million people from rural to grassroots and global communities through, our, through the following disparities initiatives. And um, on our left, we have a photo of our dear Shante Randall, who is who is a tireless advocate and who we continue to um, push forward with her initiatives that she um, shared with so many and as a voice for many. So we honor her. Um, in September, 2019, uh, we had started the Black Women, we had a Black Women at our Young, MB, Young Women's MBC Listening Summit. And then in November, 2019, we launched an MBC Disparities Advocacy an educational outreach campaign and launched our Young Women's NBC Disparities Alliance on Capitol Hill. Uh, that was in partnership with grassroots, state and local, national and global health partners and policymakers at our seventh annual Young Women's Breast Health Day on the Hill. We, um, we brought women to SABCS, Black Women for the, um, the largest group of young Black women, um, to SABCS in their 40 year history. Um, we par also partnered with GRASP, bringing together these women um, together with scientists for post sessions. In January, 2020, we assembled a cohort of 20 black women representing cities in which black women have the highest mortality rates for a year long intensive and immersive program that mobilizes these young women um, towards outreach and impact in their communities, which they live and work. 
in February 2020, we um, launched Listen Up NBC, which is a campaign to um, for young women to mobilize those who are um, to end metastatic breast cancer disparities, um, to give them a to champion them and have let them have a seat at the table, and um, to inspire and share about their um, their journeys and to be disruptors in the process. Um, they are stronger together, and that is the reason that we started that campaign. Uh, in May 2020, uh, we were at, we participated in ASCO Confab, which is through a virtual learning experience focused on the needs of Black women engaging with the scientific community. And in June 2020, we launched our inclusion pledge to end health disparities for Black women and people of color in general. Um, we are to curb this mortality, the high mortality rate that impacts our communities. And um, so far, we've had close to 12,000 signatures. Um, we have pharmaceutical partners, including Merck, Pfizer, that have signed um, advocacy groups. And um, it's really, we're holding those accountable, um, not just by signing a pledge, but making sure that they actually take steps toward ending these health disparities. Um, and it isn't just of signing their name and putting it on their website. These are, um, these are some of our NBC angel advocates that represent some of our 20 areas of impact um, from Memphis to St. Louis, Virginia Beach, Washington DC, New York, New Orleans, and so forth. Which brings us to No More Disparities. We launched No More Disparities with GRASP, um, which is co-founded by Christine and Julia, who you'll hear from shortly. Um, the concept of No More Disparities and Pull Up a Seat. Um, no More Disparities uh, conversations are facilitated for and by Black women um, and Black men uh, to create a safe space for honest conversation with Black physicians, patients, and medical clinicians to discuss their experiences of health inequality, implicit racial bias, and lessons learned. Together, we are working towards saying, once you know more about disparities, we can collectively say no more to disparities. And two weeks after, which is the pull up a seat, which is what you're here for tonight today, um, is we co-host, we host uh, these pull up a seat conversations um, with a black patient experts and a black medical health professional to amplify the voices of black men and women through candid conversations on topics ranging from racism and clinical trials and practices to unequal health, health treatments through all stages of breast cancer and determine solutions to end the high mortality rate for black women. I'm going to turn it over to Julia Malas to please um, share about GRASP. I'm unable to start my video. Okay. Um, I think, okay, one moment. Let me. But it doesn't matter. I can just talk about the slide. Okay. So um, pull up a seat which is what we're okay which is what we're talking about today and what we're doing today is a program that grasp um, is collaborating with tiger lily foundation um, so grasp stands for guiding researchers and advocates to scientific partnerships it's a program that uh, christine hodgson and i created and um, is about to turn one year um, because we started it at the San Antonio Symposium last year. So the pictures you see um, are of the, the walkthrough of posters back in another world when we used to be around other people. Um, and what we did is we brought together small groups of patients, physicians, and researchers to meet each other and connect on a, on a personal level and, and then walk through posters and discuss the science uh, with the perspective of the expert, the presenter, and the research, a, a medical professional or a researcher that can break down the science, and the patients who are the experts in living with the disease. And um, so what you can see is um, that the statistics that are presented in the poster and um, in papers, they present the macro picture. Um, and then the stories that the patients share present the, the micro picture, right? The, the personal reality of, of what's 
where each of those data points really lives. Uh, so at the bottom of this, you see um, the picture of the bald woman with, with a young child. That's Mae McCarmel, uh, the founder of the Tiger Lily Foundation. That is her own experience. And when she talks to, to um, pharmaceutical companies and researchers, and she's bringing this expertise of having actually lived what she is working on. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Or, yeah, no, never mind. Um, so you go, Shonda. Thank you, Julia. For, <laughs> yes, thank you for sharing that um, and sharing about GRASP. We're so delighted to be partnering um, with you on this project. Um, now I would like to uh, introduce uh, Sean Johnson, who um, is a four, fourth year medical student at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. His clinical and research in interests are in leveraging biomedical research to decrease health disparities and increasing the racial and ethnic diversity of patients participating in oncology clinical trials. Um, Sean Johnson, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, it's great to be here again this week. Um, I have been talking to Shonda a lot about what would be a good topic for this week. And I think one thing that for me has been really interesting thinking about, especially over the last couple of years, um, are what are the roles of institutions when we have these conversations and sort of recognizing, oh, sorry, I have to plug my computer in. <laughs> um, just recognizing that in general, when we talk about disparities, I think a lot of times Sometimes it can seem like in medicine, the conversation sort of gets turned back on us. And so it's this question of, well, what does our community need to do? What are the different ways that we need to communicate sort of the issues that we need to address? And I felt like when I was going through um, both research and in medical school in general, that I didn't hear so much about what is the role of healthcare providers? What is the role of institutions, of hospitals, of organizations like ASCO, SABCS, um, both what is their role and actually how, how have they maybe caused these things? Um, and so I wanted to kind of focus on that today and sort of thinking about what does structural racism look like um, in breast cancer disparities. So I will, sorry, share my screen. All right. I think it should be on. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I think this is a figure that um, I probably at this point, maybe everybody has seen, I think it gets shown a lot, um, sort of showing, I think sort of like a macro view of, of breast cancer disparities, right? So we've known for a long time, um, well, paradoxically for a while, there was a decreased incidence in breast cancer in black women. And, and now that it's sort of actually caught up and, and it might've actually surpassed at this point, um, incidence in black women versus white women. But there was this really severe mortality gap for a long time. And that is sort of the, the, the end point of a lot of the disparities we talk about is this sort of really, again, striking mortality difference. Um, and all healthcare disparities, I think at some point you can kind of boil them down to, to different levels of racism. And this, for me, was always sort of a helpful figure to kind of think about whenever we talk about this, because there are multiple different types of racism, right? And so that can leverage everything from personal, sometimes the things that we, um, that we take in and that we start to believe ourselves because we're taught them by society, um, all the way to things like institutional and structural racism. We're really talking about things that are a little bit more subtle and oftentimes they're not as well seen, uh, but they can a lot of times be sort of the primary drivers of the day to day um, disparities that we see sort of played out in our daily lives. And so a helpful quote for this, I, I'm always a big fan of sort of returning to the civil rights movement whenever we're talking about kind of anything, because why not? There's no point in rebuilding the wheels. So sort of like stand on the shoulder of giants. Um, and this was a quote by Kwame Tori that I think was really helpful for me, again, both thinking about institutional racism, but also about why we seem to not sometimes in medicine um, talk about the, the structures in the institutions as opposed to sort of these smaller scale types of things. And so I'll just read through this really quick. Um, so this is from, again, uh, 1967. And he's saying, racism is both overt and covert. It takes two closely related forms, individual whites acting against individual blacks and acts by the total white community against the black community. We call these individual racism and institutional racism. The first consists of overt acts by individuals which cause death, injury, or the violent destruction of property. This type can be recorded by television cameras. It can frequently be observed in the process of commission. 
The second type is less overt, far more subtle, less identifiable in terms of specific individuals committing the acts, but it is no less destructive of human life. The second type originates in the operation of established and respected forces in society and thus receives far less public condemnation than the first type. When a black family moves into a home in a white neighborhood and is stoned, burned, or rooted out, they are victims of an overt act of individual racism, which many people will condemn, at least in words. But it is institutional racism that keeps black people locked in dilapidated slum tenements, subject to the daily prey of exploitative slum lords, merchants, loan sharks, and discriminatory real estate agents. Society either pretends it does not know of this latter situation or is in fact incapable of doing anything meaningful about it. And so this, again, I've read this so many times. And for me, again, the first time I read this when I was in medical school, it really spoke to me in thinking about disparities because I felt like this was actually really true. Uh, a lot of the conversations sometimes that we have and that I think the medical community sort of um, instigates when it comes to talking about breast cancer disparities, they are really kind of on this micro scale. And a lot of times, oddly, it are, they're focused on things that we're supposed to do, right? Like we're supposed to go out in the community and educate our friends and family about uh, cancer and cancer screenings. And we're supposed to address historical mistrust in our community uh, and, and move past that and, and partner with researchers. But a lot of times we don't kind of talk about what hospitals are supposed to do and what, and what their role, again, both has been and what their responsibility should be to change. And so I wanted to go through three, I think, really key examples of how this plays out in medicine. And the first is healthcare segregation in the United States. And so this is a picture again from the civil rights movement or sort of the civil rights era at a hospital in the South, things in South Carolina. Um, and, and this was the standard for, for hospital care in the US really up until about 1966 or 1967. So for, for, for the longest time, there either were no hospitals that black patients could use, or if there were hospitals that allowed black patients to be treated, they were basically shuttled into the basements in these wards that were like dilapidated. Um, they weren't seen by the same providers as white physicians. They weren't seen in the same waiting rooms as white patients. They were basically kept out in, in, in again, in these really sort of like, like sort of shanty um, dilapidated sort of um, uh, medical facilities. And so this is a picture again in this hospital of what was called a colored obstetrics ward. Um, and this was the norm. And I think an interesting thing to think about, which should really influence the conversation to get today, is that this didn't end in the US. We, haven't, we, we didn't get rid of segregation in healthcare because medical professionals woke up one day and realized, wow, this is terrible. This is abhorrent. This is really unethical. Uh, it was actually enforced pretty rapidly by the government. So in 1965, there was a really interesting intersection of two things that happened. The Civil Rights Act was passed, and then Medicare, Medicaid were also implemented. And so hospitals in the 60s, again, only 60 years ago, were actually still very committed to segregating their patient populations. And the only reason why we don't have any more legally enforced segregation in hospitals is because in order for these hospitals to get money from Medicare and from Medicaid, they were actually forced to be in compliance with the Civil Rights Act. And so actually no hospital has really changed their, their altruistic sort of view on these issues. It was actually a group of black civil rights activists who worked in the federal government who went around the country and enforced this. And so we got rid of legal segregation in hospitals in 1965 and 1966, but we haven't actually, again, really gotten to this dream of having truly integrated healthcare. So this was a paper that came out in 2007 that was looking at, okay, now it's been 40, 40 years, right? 40, 42 years since this happened. Where are we at today? And the reality is we haven't actually done that well. So 50% of black patients were treated in just 5% of hospitals in the United States. That is, that is incredible segregation. That's, actually, that's I, I actually can't think of any more examples of institutions if you're talking about, again, education, um, if you're talking about housing of neighborhoods where we see this extreme of segregation. Uh, another really sort of uh, disturbing statistic, 75% of all black infants are born in just 25% of hospitals in the United States. Um, so again, thinking about um, prenatal care and obstetric care, also incredibly, incredibly segregated in the US. And as has always been in the case in the US, segregation is never equal. There is no such thing as separate but equal. And so what does this look like? So nationally, we continue to basically, uh, the country has enforced and, and shuttled black patients in our community into this sort of low quality second tier healthcare system. 
So we know that nationally, if you look at this, and, and it's odd because anecdotally, you probably know some people who maybe are at good hospitals, but if we look across the entire country, nationally, black patients are far, far disproportionately treated at low quality hospitals. So hospitals that if you were to look at outcomes for various different things like heart attacks, pneumonia, cancer care, uh, hospitals that score a lot lower um, than, than sort of fancier hospitals. And also, again, paradoxically at, at high cost hospitals. So we talk a lot in the US about the fact that US patients don't get great healthcare for the money. This is extremely worse when it comes to black patients. So black patients are, are basically shuttled to these hospitals that have the lowest quality and they pay the highest costs. And this for me is really personal because in my city, this is something that I see every day. Uh, and what I'll tell you, this is something that again, it, Boston is a helpful example to kind of talk about, but this is true it, truly in every city, whether it's New York, Chicago, LA, um, in our city, 25% of Boston is black, which sometimes you wouldn't really know because Boston is so segregated. Um, but what does this look like in our healthcare system? Well, 5% of patients at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which is like the fancy, fancy cancer hospital in Boston and kind of in the country, only 5% of patients at Dana-Farber are black. And that statistic is bad itself because 5% is clearly nowhere near 25%. But it's actually even more problematic when we talk about cancer care because we know various cancers are actually much more, um, the incidence is much higher in black patients. And so this number should actually be significantly higher than 25% and it's still not, it's floating at 5%. And so where do these patients receive care? Well, in our city, we've basically shuttled all of the high needs patients into a single hospital, um, sorry, called Boston Medical Center. And so we have, like so many cities, this safety net hospital that has for the longest time been mission driven, that cares for the uninsured, the underinsured for patients of color. And 50% of the patients at that hospital are black. And so of course, this isn't just an issue of the fact that the waiting rooms people uh, are, not, are not intermixed in, in that people aren't going to the same hospitals. It actually plays out really bad again when we think about cancer care. And so one example of this are clinical trials. And so I actually, I did this last night um, and every time I've done this every couple of months, it always gets worse. So this is clinicaltrials.gov, which of course you can use to sort of um, look at cl for clinical trials in your city. And what I did last night was I put in metastatic breast cancer and I just looked at both hospitals. And so in our city, at the hospital that predominantly serves the uninsured black patients, underinsured patients, you can find 12 clinical trials for patients with metastatic breast cancer. If you now go to the hospital that is predominantly white, that is predominantly affluent, there are 153 clinical trials for metastatic breast cancer, right? And if you further uh, group this down by just studies that are enrolling, so if you were to call the hospital, right, in studies that aren't active, but actually have open spots available, at Boston Medical Center, there's one. So there's one clinical trial for metastatic breast cancer patients that actually is taking patients right now at BMC versus I think 45 at, at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So, so this like on a micro scale is terrible. And again, this plays out in every single city. We see this over and over again, that we've basically set up this two tiered healthcare system when it comes to uh, cancer care in the US. And so the second example, and this kind of leads into the first I wanna talk about is insurance. Um, and this again, thinking about sort of like the financial toxicity of cancer um, comes up a lot. And this again is one of these things that we can't change, like institutions really have to change. So this is the legacy of Obamacare. Um, and so in 2010, right, we didn't have the Affordable Care Act. And throughout the US, always there have been terrible, terrible disparities in who is uninsured and who is underinsured. And so you can see way back in 2010, the rate of uninsured uh, in the black population, it was 32. So 32% of our community was uninsured compared to only 13% of white patients. And so in 2018, Obamacare gets passed. And this is whenever people tell you that, the Affordable Care Act did nothing tell them that they're nuts because the Affordable Care Act did incredible things, especially for cancer care. So we saw this dramatic decrease in the uninsured population, but we still have these really terrible disparities when it comes to who is uninsured and underinsured. But of course, the way that all these people got insurance uh, and the way that a lot of people in our community got insurance were these insurance plans that were created by Obamacare, right? So these weren't that people were getting insurance through their jobs. It's that the government created insurance plans that were supposed to create equity and actually finally allow the uninsured and our community, this huge amount of people in our community to have insurance. Well, what ended up happening when we created those insurance plans? Sure enough, after the Affordable Care Act got passed, you started seeing article after article like this top cancer centers off limits under Obamacare. So these insurance plans that were created that are disproportionately used by people of color, not accepted at these like large cancer hospitals. 
individual hospitals like MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Cedar sinai also not taking any of these insurance plans at all. And so this is one of the interesting and like really terrible things about the Affordable Care Act is one of the concerns has been that it in a weird way is actually hyper segregated cancer care even more because uninsured patients used to not actually be able to be denied care at some of these places where these Affordable Care Act plans actually can be denied. And so we started again seeing a lot of these stories about this. Um, and on a macro level, just sort of across the country, I'll give you like sort of a final statistic. Um, two years ago, there was a study that looked at the NCI designated cancer centers. So these are gonna like the top of the top, the cream of the crop. 25% of them didn't take any insurance plans that are on the Affordable Care Act, right? That's a quarter of these hospitals across the country. In 93% of these cancer uh, of these cancer hospitals reported that they either were unavailable on a large number or like a majority of ACA plans in, in, um, in their city. And again, this has really obvious implications. Uh, this was a study that was in 2015 that found that patients with various types of cancer, so breast, colorectal, lung, pancreatic, gastric, bile duct, were 20 to 50% more likely to die if they were initially treated somewhere else than an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. So, so this, this is obvious way this is gonna play out, right? And of course in medicine, we'll sit and we'll twiddle our thumbs and we'll wait for the data to come out in like in five years or in 10 years, we'll find that, wow, really surprisingly, we're seeing this as affects mortality, but we don't need to wait to know what's gonna happen. Like this, this is an obvious sort of consequence that's gonna play out. And so, and so the last thing I just wanna sort of talk about, because especially in cancer care, it's such a huge thing that again, like the institutions need to address that like we really can't change ourselves um, is, is financial toxicity when it comes to drug pricing. So this is looking at um, the monthly cost over time of, of a cost of, um, of, of oncology drugs for a patient. And I think this is something that you kind of talk about like the frog in the pot of like boiling water, right? You slowly increase the temperature of the water and the frog doesn't notice and eventually the frog is boiling. Um, this has really been the case with, with cancer drugs in general, because I think sometimes we can get used to thinking that these drugs were just thousands and thousands of dollars but this is actually ridiculous. Like this, this was not true until recently. So you can see all the way back in 1975, the, the monthly cost was $100. And we've gotten to the point now where it's $10,000, right? So it, it's, it's dramatically gone up. And you can actually see this is also exponential growth, right? Because even only from this 25 year period from 1975 to 1995, it's basically a 10 times increase. But now we've gone from 1,000 to 10,000 in a 10 year period. Uh, and so, and so the, again, this is just getting worse. And there's really two ways that this sort of plays out. One, which is just really drives me nuts, is what you'll see a lot of news stories about, which is that the same drug just all of a sudden becomes expensive and nothing has happened with it. And so this is an example of this drug called uh, Lomastine, which in 2013 was $50 per pill and now is $768 per pill. Nothing is different. It's, it's the exact same drug. Nothing has changed at all, right? Um, if you know anybody who has myeloma, there's a drug called Revlimid which has been a really bad example of this, which Katie Porter, who's a senator, has really sort of um, made like a big issue of her, uh, of her committee. Um, but the other place for breast cancer that actually matters a lot is immunotherapy. So at this point, I don't think anybody probably has not heard of immunotherapy. And this has especially been a big deal in triple negative breast cancer, which we know is much, much more disproportionately impacts black women. Um, Triple negative breast cancer is actually one of the places where immunotherapy looks the most promising. It's where some of the really good uh, data is finally coming out for drugs like PD-1 and PD-L1. Um, but the costs of immunotherapy are, are truly ridiculous. Um, so this was a, a study that I remember when I first saw this, this floored me. And I remember seeing this about four or five years ago. And so this was looking at a combination of immunotherapy that was getting approved. And, and this is the, the direction that everything is going. Like all of these drugs are meant to be done in, in combinations of two or three drugs. So one of the drugs alone was already $100,000 per year. And for melanoma patients, there was this combination of two drugs called nivolumab and ipilimumab, which are approved together. The combination of those two drugs was $295,000 a year. And melanoma is not a, a, a small indication, right? Where we can say, oh, well, the government's gonna do something because it's only 10 patients a year. So we can figure out a way that like the whole taxpayer will deal with this. That, that is not gonna happen. Melanoma is, that's tens of thousands of people just in this indication who are available. And if we're moving this direction for breast cancer, for lung cancer, for colorectal cancer, and soon every, every cancer, this is gonna be the cost to treat them is hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And, and this is the point where again, we're like, we can't, 
we can't fix this by just saying, oh, well, like black cancer patients need to talk to other black cancer patients and we need to talk to our families about cancer care. Like this is truly an institutional and a pharmaceutical issue that needs to be addressed. And just for breast cancer, I mean, this is um, how people sort of think about like the future. This, these are projected revenues, right? So cancer is very lucrative for a large number of people. Uh, and, and you can see this is not projected to slow down anytime soon. Um, and, and again, I think it just sort of raises this question of as we get to this era where we are making fancier drugs and more expensive drugs, this is something that I, I like to, I think it's important to talk about a lot. Um, we actually create a lot of these disparities, right? Like we can say that there's differences when um, different maybe patient groups are diagnosed with cancer or maybe sort of maybe live in communities where there's more pollution because of the history of the US. But those are things that are kind of pre-existing we are actually creating new disparities every day when we do this, because we know in the US, because this is the US, um, and actually globally too, we know that patients of color are more likely to be low income because of the way we set up our society. So any socioeconomic disparity is automatically a racial disparity. That is always the case. And so if we're creating a system where we have this two tiered system of have and have nots, where the wealthy can afford one set of drugs and people who aren't wealthy can, can't afford another, we are again actually in real time creating worsening racial disparities as we go through. And so I really sort of just wanted to end on this point and sort of stress this, this idea that breast cancer disparities are actually, they're a civil rights issue. And I think there are different places where we have adapted the language of civil rights and of equity really well. And I think the Affordable Care Act protests were a really good example of this in medicine. So when the new administration, gone soon, came in and were threatening to repeal the ACA, people were in the streets and were protesting and marching about it. And insurance has really become a, a, an issue that people are active and passionate about. And I think we really need to push this conversation to also say a breast cancer, it's the exact same thing. Like it is a civil rights issue. These things are worth protesting about. They are worth petitioning about. They are worth pushing legislators in policy on um, because again, they are not just issues that are some weird coincidence or, or, or um, outcome of something unique about our community. These are large institutional forces that are pushing this and that are creating it. And like any sort of institutional racism, it requires the institutions to change. So there's only so much that we can do in our community to address this. At some point, the institutions have to do this. And so I think it's something that's really worth thinking about is when it comes to, again, every institution is always great people, right? You can go to the worst school system in the world and there's great passionate teachers who really care about their kids. It's the same thing for healthcare professionals. Even if your oncologist is like the nicest person in the world, they're still a part of the system. I'm a part of the system now. I've crossed the lexicon and now I'm in it. And so there's this question of what is the role of your oncologist, I think, of your hospital, and then also these organizations like SABCS, ASCO, who are paying a lot of lip service right now and saying that they really care about this. What is their responsibility as well to change some of, again, these large um, institutional factors that are really enforcing and creating these disparities that we see between Black women and white women in breast cancer? And so with that, I will turn it back over. Stop it. So I believe Shonda. Sean, this, wow. I mean, thank you. I'm livid right now. I am like, just angry because of the information. I'm so grateful. Thank you for sharing this information with us. Um, knowledge is definitely power. This is why we need to understand and know um, what is happening, like you said, breast cancer disparities is a civil rights issue and we need to get out there. We need to like protest. I was just sending a message to one of our, um, someone with Integra Believe right now, like we need to have a list because we need to start petitioning people. This is ridiculous. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and I look forward to um, the comments in the chat. People are just saying how rich this is. Thank you for literally dropping the mic on this conversation, um, spitting straight facts with data not just, you know, and letting us know that really these disparities are happening. We are creating new ones daily. So it isn't up to us. This is the onus isn't on us. It's also on these companies that are continue to increase the prices of these drugs. This is absolutely ridiculous. And thank you so much for sharing this. Um, I would like just ask everyone, um, those who have questions or comments to Sean, um, to please put them in the chat. We are, I'm gonna hand it over now to Julia who is going to explain how the next portion of our um, conversation is going. We're going to go into breakout rooms to discuss this further and unpack this conversation. 
Thank you, Shonda. And thank you, Sean. This was really amazing. I think many of us had text messages going with other people saying, we need to do something about this right now. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take the, the high level data that Sean presented, and we're going to bring it down to the level of oops, someone needs to mute their mic, bring it down to the individual level of specific people that lived through this system as black women with a history of breast cancer. And they're gonna share their experience and they're gonna share um, what, how they were treated, how um, their relationship with healthcare provider works and how, how things are done right or how things are done wrong and how they can be improved. So this is gonna be a very, um, a very intimate conversation. And it is a place where we ask you to be vulnerable and open and uh, open-minded about um, what other people are saying. Everyone is here really uh, in an effort to improve this situation. And more than anything, we just have to shine a light on the stories of these women. Uh, they are experts in living with cancer and specifically as black women and navigating this very, very messed up system uh, that we saw Sean talk about. So uh, what's gonna happen now is I assigned uh, people to separate groups. Each group will be led by one of the patient experts. Um, everyone is gonna be in a group. We're not gonna have a main room this time. And um, they're gonna facilitate a, a, a small group intimate discussion about the problems we just heard. Uh, so they're gonna introduce themselves. You'll have a chance to introduce yourself. We really wanna facilitate the human connection aspect of this. Um, so if you haven't uh, experienced breakout rooms in Zoom before, basically um, you're gonna get um, a, a message that is gonna say you're being moved to a separate room. And instead of seeing a big grid with all of us on it, you're gonna see a smaller grid with just uh, five or six people. And, um, and that part is not being recorded. So feel free to be completely candid. Uh, we do have someone taking notes without attributions. We just wanna record the messaging in this conversation. Uh, we are back. Whew. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, for those who are um, still with us as we I have, you know, been through our breakout rooms. Um, I hope that the time on those calls um, were really impactful. I know our small group, I was in a group that was led by Temi, um, you know, was, we had a lot of takeaways and had real conversations. So um, please feel free for those who I know who may have to hop off those who are in our breakout rooms. Um, I see Charles is putting his contact, the contact information. Um, also, if the, you would like to keep in contact with um, our speakers, please put your contact details in the chat um, and we can share that with them or share it directly through a private message if you don't want to share it to the group. Um, so I'm just, uh, I want to make sure I don't see. Okay, I see Sean. All right, Sean's here too. Okay. Um, now I'm just going to ask um, everyone, each of our group members um, to go around and just share um, your takeaways, uh, some of the solutions um, that you found, or just your thoughts, reflections on how that breakout session was um, in this moment. Uh, so I'm going to start with breakout room one. Hi. Oh, my goodness. Shonda, I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> it was so rich. Mm -hmm. uh, one awesome thing, oh, two awesome things, three awesome things. We had a male in our group. Uh, and Charles was absolutely amazing. Uh, and one of the things that Charles brought to us was his ability to engage, relate. You know, he, he brought the male's perspective and, and his wisdom, you know, and, and he encourages men to be a part of these forums. And he said, you know, sometimes we have to learn to just be quiet and listen and be there, you know, and, and not try to fix everything. Um, and, and so I appreciated his presence and his great perspective. 
um, and, and the work that he does in data building and, and supporting others and, and tracking what's happening with them so that they can present it to their medical uh, experts you know, when they go in for support. And so thank you, Charles. And we had Tova's Aunt Ruthie. She talked about Aunt Ruthie last week. <laughs> the keeper of the wisdom, the family knowledge and, and, and history, like, oh, and, and, and so we talked about caregivers and the importance of caregivers. And Aunt Ruthie, you know, she's an elder, you know, she's an elder in the community. And, and she talked about, you know, her assignment changing from baking to caretaking and, and her willingness to travel across the country to support her niece. Like, you know, and we, we talked about how important people who, who are in her role are to us that we can't make it without them. You know, and Charles brought some neurological science to that and, and what it means to feel loved and supported. And, and he talked to us about, you know, tumors growing larger when you feel lonely, you know, and, and, and the, the things that are triggered in our body that worsen our condition. And so thank you to all of our caretakers. Um, we had um, a beautiful sister, Ashley, in our group who talked to us from the perspective of being a daughter um, of, of a mom who, who lost her life to breast cancer and, and her dad losing his life to cancer and, and how you know she developed a, a sense of like PS, P, PTSD um, and, 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 and understanding early in her life that it was important for her to go and get genetic counseling and testing and, and the, the challenges that she had being young trying to get testing, you know, and being told, well, what are you doing here? You're too young, you know? And so, you know, us having that conversation about how the medical field uh, can be more engaging, more supportive, even in situations that they may not understand because you don't know what someone else is going through, you know? And Ashley talked about the, the them being the authority, them being the experts, the one that we're coming to and how we need them to be on board with our care, you know? Um, and then I, of course, shared my journey and, and what it took for my younger sister to, who's eight years younger to, than me to get tested. Even after she presented facts, you know, she was told that, no, that you don't have to worry about this happening to you. And it took for, her to tell them my sister just got diagnosed for them to finally listen to her, for her to only have been tested positive for cancer. Lives are being lost because people are not listening, you know? And, and so we address so many more things and I, you know, I wanna be cognizant of my time, but it was an amazing breakout group. Thank you so much for the experience. Thank you, Latalia. Thank you for your voice. And just, I mean, I've, I'm sure everyone else in here who wasn't in that breakout room feels what was in that breakout room, that it was so powerful. So thank you for sharing that um, and for guiding that conversation. You know, um, it really, so grateful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're going to ask uh, breakout group leader number two. Hi, um, we, um, in my group, we basically had an intimate um, discussion. Um, I was there with John Womack. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. The other um, um, ally was was unable to participate. So we, we ended up having a very in intimate conversation. And we spoke about a lot of the things um, that were discussed in groups, group one's feedback. Um, for example, um, the medical, the, the need for the medical um, providers to bring their energy to the patient so that the patients, they can, in addition to their expertise, they need to understand and be, they need to be aware and of what the patient needs to get through their journey because each individual is different, right? So if it's statistics that the person needs, if it's encouragement that the person needs, you, you, maybe that person isn't pro providing it directly, but they need to be able to offer um, a resource for that individual to get what they need. Um, and also, um, Latalia spoke about um, being heard. Um, I spoke about my journey and transferring from one uh, medical facility to another because uh, I wasn't 
heard when I said, hey, I feel like something's um, going on with my right breast, even though I didn't have any signs or symptoms, they basically dismissed it uh, very adamantly. And then exactly what I said, you know, something, something was actually wrong with it. So being heard is also very, very important. Um, I, I talked through my journey and I, in our discussion, I told John, you know, I'm very well aware that everything that I had access to, um, everyone does not have access to. And that's the reason that we're having this conversation. That's the reason that we're participating on this panel discussion. Uh, so I'm not oblivious to that. I was very, made very well aware of it when I first started sitting down in the medical offices and I didn't see anybody that looked like me in all of the times that I was there with my oncologist, with my radiologist and the chemo treatments. There, there was no one, no young black women in there. Um, and so I, I threw out a number for him and it, it's, this is something that you got, everybody can get on the internet. So it's not too personal. And I said, you know, my insurance was able to offer just for the cost of one year of care, excluding radiation, a million and a half dollars. Who can afford that? That was the cost of my care for one year so that I could be cancer free at the end of one year with no radiation. Everybody off of the street just can't afford that. And why does it cost that much in the base case? Even for me, that's the question. I should, no one should have to pay that. And it, is, it goes back to those disparities that Sean talks about that we're creating. So we started talking about that as well. Um, and just, you know, basically next steps on what needs to happen in order for change to happen. And, you know, so we talked about, yeah, advocacy is great. And these importance, these discussions are very important, but until someone looks at the reasons for the disparities and starts to close those gaps so that everyone could be treated consistently and equitably, then those changes are going to still, still exist. But, you know, this is what we're doing here is important work um, to promote that change, but a change is needed. Thank you, Tova. Thank you for that. You were talking and the wheels are turning. I was about to type in the chat just from what you were saying. And I'm about to say something, Julia is going to be like, wait, what, Chanda? I don't know if we need to have a working group out of this whole thing so that we can um, put this to, you know, all the different panelists and those who have been really key participants in this for us to come together to, whether it's create, like Sean was saying, this is a, this is a civil rights issue that we need to create something to petition to really move this forward. Um, because this is, these conversations are so important and they're, I mean, as we're gonna continue to hear, they're so, they, they really move people and they're also just create something for, there's, they create a space for change. So mm -hmm. while we're in this space and we continue to have this energy, why don't we, um, you know, yes, like move forward, like Mayma was saying in the, in the DM, we need legislation. So for us to work together towards this legislation mm -hmm. as a collective, as a group um, to do that. So um, anyway, that'll be a follow up. Go ahead, Tova. <laughs> So oh, I, I just thought about one, when you said a civil rights issue and, I, and I'm aware of this, yes. I'm going to be really quick. One thing yeah. that John, um, he can't participate because he, he had to get off. But one thing mm -hmm. that he actually was quite um, taken by or surprised by was that he asked me a question, you know, well, how does it, did it feel to have to, you know, advocate for yourself? And I told him, as a black woman, this is what we do. I advocated my, for myself from HBCU to a predominantly white institution. I advocated for myself going into corporate America. I advocate for my kids in the school. So this is normal for me, but it should, just because it's normal for me, doesn't mean that it's accepted, that this should be the case. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, I mean, I was just thinking something when Shonda was saying it, and then Christine texted me exactly the same thing, which of course we always are <laughs> the same, but um, I just, I am so heartened that I see such few white people on this call today. And I am just so pissed that people are not doing more. Yes, Tova, you've had to advocate your entire life, but it's time for people that look like me to get their shit together and to do something. Like, this is crazy. I cannot believe, you know, my tweets about this have always been like, oh, 
Are you talking about all your anti-racism work? I wanna see you actually join this and talk with these black women about their experience and listen to them and learn from them. Like, where are the people that are not here? And, um, and I, I just feel like so, I am so sorry for people like me not being here. Like I, my apology to you that white people can't get their shit together. Um, this has been really what motivates me and, and what um, has driven me over the last year. Um, one of my best friends died a week ago yesterday and she was a black woman and I don't believe she got the care that she would have gotten if her skin looked like my skin because other people are racist. So anyway. Thank you, Julia. Yes, um, we, as Julia said, we lost um, someone, Shante Randall, who I shared her picture earlier um, last week. Um, and, you know, there are people on this call, Julia, um, Roberta, Mema, there are a lot of people who, um, who know her, who were impacted by her and are still dealing with that and unpacking um, what that, the grief that they're dealing with. And they still showed up today despite that they still showed up because it's so important um so i just you know thank you and i just want people to be aware of and they are aware of what is really happening you know um we've had uh i'm gonna go to the break breakout group three but i'm also just saying too in terms of numbers on these calls we have had um, from the large like julia just mentioned about there being um not being that many white participants this time there it's been like a trickle, you know, from being a huge boom and then it's like reduced, you know? And, um, but we're gonna keep going um, and keep on pushing. There are people- and there were there, many signups. Um, so that's even, yeah. you know, there were many signups and many people that didn't show up. And Mayma called it. I remember when George Floyd and all that like started to really grow the attention on disparities and she's like, I just don't want it to slow down. I want people to keep worrying about it. It's gonna keep being a problem, but I know they're they're gonna go away. And yeah, I I, just, I will I it is our responsibility as white people, Christine and me, to to uh, go to our communities and call them out. Um, and 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 we will continue doing that. Can I just, I just want, can I just say something really quick? Sorry, just yeah. go back Go ahead. To what you had said that I agree, like when the whole George Floyd, George Floyd thing had came about and everybody, you know, they was putting up their little black squares and they were so pro-black and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm standing up for black women. And it was like, is this a fad? I like, y'all like doing this because this is what you think is the hot trend right now. It's like, listen, I've been black. We've been black. We've been here. Where have you been? Where are you now? Like we didn't just come about because there's like a black movement right now. Like you, you didn't want to partake in this before. That's why a lot of times when they be wanting to do this, like, oh, we want to partner with you because no, because I've been black before George Floyd happened, and you didn't think about me before that. Now it's a movement. Now if you put your little black square, now you want to come holler at me. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in your little fake activism. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. I don't like that. And I just wanted to piggyback off of what she said about that because I agree. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> sorry not sorry <laughs> yes preach preach um we are going to break out group number three who who is the all right that's me so <laughs> this is the idea so we had a um small but mighty group and like most on this call i will say like we came to fight like so we put it all out there and we talked so we had we had the um the pleasure of having um, Latoya, um, her younger sister, Angel, was in, in the group. So we talked about a lot of things. We, I know like, oh, powerful story. Like, you know, for the sake of time, we're gonna have to really unpack this because Angel laid it on us. And, you know, like even from my story, like she doubled down on some of the experiences um, that, that I have. 
um, that I had, but we talked about, so like Tova said, we addressed the privilege. So I addressed the fact that I, you know, I was privileged. I went in, you know, with healthcare, I was employed. Um, so I, I was stacked with a couple of things. So I won't deny that. But even with that privilege, I still ran into some roadblocks with the, the care that I received and how, how, how I was approached um, with my treatment. So we talked about some things that were, um, that were kind of addressed in my story and um, in Angel's story. And we also had Tisha on the call with us, you know, as a researcher. So she understands all the stats behind these things that we're saying, like, we're not making this stuff up. Like, it's real. This is happening. Um, but one thing we talked about when Angel went in, Angel um, had her family history. On a previous call and other platforms, we spoke about um, having that secret, you know, the family secrets, not understanding the history, not wanting to talk about the family history in fear or because of denial. This wasn't the case when Angel walked in. She walked in understanding, okay, my sister was just diagnosed, my, you know, my great aunts, my grandmother. So you walk into a physician office and you tell them, this is what's happening to me. This is what's happening in my family. And you were still, she was still discounted and, you know, and her and kind of rejected because, oh, well, that's on the, you know, that's on the male side of the family. So you won't get breast cancer. So you walk into a facility that you trust and you, um, there's miseducation, you know, they're approaching you with miseducation and with miss. So what do we do with that information if these are the people that we trust with our care and we're giving them the things that they say are causing the disparities? We don't understand our family history. We don't have the resources. Okay, but she walked in with family history. She was there because she wanted to explore all her options and she was ready to hear um, from these physicians, what, what do I do next? You know, according to all these other stories in my family, and it was discounted and it was rejected. And, you know, for me, having an understanding of the lifestyle that I wanted to live and rejecting some of the treatment that was offered to me, when you approach a physician and you say, okay, this is what I have, but I won't accept certain things. She wants to keep pushing for testing, even though they were telling her, no, you know, you don't really need, you know, there's no, there's no need for this testing. You won't get it. And she was told several times before she was diagnosed that she wouldn't get it because it was on, you know, it was on the, on the male side of the family. So, oh, you, you know, that doesn't apply to you. So what do you do when you're approaching a physician with information is rejected because it's, I guess, beyond their understanding or they don't want to accept, you know, they don't want to accept what you're, you know, what you're presenting to them. And for me on the flip side, I didn't want to take tamoxifen. So I felt like I was rejected after I said, this is, you know, I want to be seen as a person that's going to survive this disease. So, and I'm making those, those choices accordingly um, for, for my future. Um, but it's like, oh, well, you don't want to do this. Well, you know, okay, well, you can come back, you know, for this screening or you can come back for these labs, but because I'm, I, I don't want to fall within that standard protocol of care because that wasn't what was good for Nadia. Some of, you know, our concerns are, um, you know, our concerns are kind of rejected and discounted. So we came with, you know, in, in recap was, you know, we talked a lot about genetic counseling, how it's not available, how it should be available and in circumstances where we have enough information for them to be more aggressive with their approach toward offering um, genetic counseling, um, it's just not happening. Like for me, I don't have children and I made it very clear that, you know, I do want to entertain the possibility of having children, which, which means that although I did have the BRCA test, um, I still need to understand genetic counseling because, you know, I have a future, you know, I have a future to plan for. And I also have a brother and it, when um, Natalia, when Angel brought it up, you know, because it's on the male side of the family, until groups like this, I didn't even really, really understand that I need to have this discussion with, with my brother, you know, as well. So it's not just a woman's disease. This is something that, you know, we all should be talking about. So as a recap for our conversation, we, you know, we said that, you know, we have to do two things and we have this, we have this burden of living with it and fighting at the same time. So we go between being overwhelmed and angry, overwhelmed and angry. You know, we go, we toggle between these, these emotions and we're using it for the purpose here of fighting for others. But in order to really have change, Julia spoke about it. We have to have our allies and we have to have allies that don't look like us. You know, and it's just, you know, we would love to make this change ourselves, but Sean addressed it that, you know, the institutional and the structural racism is not put in place for us to do this alone. So we have to have 
um, we, you know, in conclusion, we just have to have those allies to, to make the change. It's, Thank you, it's, yeah. not a, oh. it's not a black or white thing. It's a truth versus darkness thing. And absolutely, you, know, you I totally agree with the speaker who said, you know, it became really trendy a few months ago to be to walk in a protest. But the longer journey, the longer fight, you know, is going to have to include the entire village. Yep. yep. You said it. It's, you know, this is a civil rights thing, you know, take away race. You know, we invented that. So you take away race, like this is something, it's, this is a civil rights issue. You know, this is humanity. You know, this is our survival. Yes, our survival. Yep. It's humanity. We are humans. We are human beings. That was something that we talked about in our group too. I'm going to ask um, Temi um, to please share um, from group four. Oh, so group four, we have two more groups, Lakeisha and um, Temi. Thank you. Um, my group was very informative. Um, everyone was just so real. Like we didn't sugarcoat anything. It was great. Um, I had Shonda, Roberta and Margaret in my group. Um, so we started off just by me sharing my journey. And the reason I'm sitting here like talking to everyone now in the first place is because I advocated for myself. So even when, um, you know, so I had a breast reduction and that's how I found out I had breast cancer. So when I went for my breast reduction, I asked my plastic surgeon what he does with the tissue. And he told me he's not losing sleep if we throw it away or send it to pathology. And I had to, you know, push for him to send it to pathology. So the reason I found out I had cancer and I'm sitting here now speaking to you all is because I advocated for myself. Um, and I also talked about my how I had to fire two doctors before I got to my third doctor that I felt comfortable with because I just felt like I wasn't taking being taken seriously. Um, people thought that I was too young. Um, I didn't know if they were doing the things they were doing because I was young or because I was black or because I was a young black, if it was a combination of everything. But the, um, the racism was pretty clear. Um, I, I had times I'll go to the hospital and like, they'll be talking to my mom, like she was the patient and I'm there, like, you know, young people get, um, breast cancer too. And that's what, you know, fuels in the mind of people who are young that, oh, it can be breast cancer. And that's why some people who are young and have symptoms, they don't go to the hospital or they don't take it seriously because, you know, I'm young, it's nothing, but young people do get breast cancer, um, a lot more than people, you know, talk about. Um, and then I also brought up a scenario where I had my double mastectomy. I was never prescribed muscle relaxers and I was in so much pain and I had to find out on like a Facebook group that I should have been prescribed muscle relaxers and just questions like that. Like, why wasn't I prescribed muscle relaxers if I didn't find it on the Facebook group? You know, I would have been in so much pain that I didn't have to go through. So it's just a lot of healthcare providers, you know, making assumptions for Black people, not giving us all the information that's available to us, and we have to do the work. I had to be my own social worker. I had to be my own nurse. My, like, I had to coordinate everything and advocate for myself, <clears throat> and I feel like they could have definitely helped with that. Um, and Margaret in my group asked, you know, what would have given me a more positive experience through my journey, and I shared how just more personalized care. Um, I would have loved if they treated me like a person, like Temi. Okay, this is Temi. She just turned 23. She's been diagnosed with breast cancer. This is her story. And not just like I was just, you know, just anyone because I was young. Um, I do want to have kids. These are conversations I had to bring up you know, they didn't bring it up. And it was just breast cancer survivors I met on Instagram, Facebook, giving me questions to ask these people. So why am I finding out more on social media than what my hospital is offering me? Um, we talked about how racism is a public health crisis, how black women are dying at an alarming rate because of racism in healthcare, be it breast cancer, childbirth, whatever it is, black people are just, you know, unfortunately dying in the hands of the healthcare system and it's not on black people it's not our responsibility to you know do all the heavy lifting do all the work and we just talked about how we're tired of being traumatized and re-traumatized over and over again talking about this stuff but no change is taking place so we need action um i'm tired of talking about the same thing being black 
in America, we have so much to think about. And then, you know, dealing with cancer while Black is just a lot. And um, Margaret shared how um, the healthcare system is broken, it's extremely flawed, and there needs to be more individual care. You know, doctors need to stop making assumptions for us and just take us seriously. And Roberta was also in my group. She gave amazing points um, and showed to Shonda. She gave amazing points too. And um, I also spoke about how due to the lack of representation in the healthcare system, going through my journey, I decided that I wanted to go back to school to become a genetic counselor just because I think it's only 1% of genetic counselors that are Black. And out of that 1%, I don't even know how many are women. So yeah, the representation is really important. So yeah, that's what we spoke about in my group. Thank you, Tammy. Yay. And we're so, so proud of, just proud of you for even the, I mean, talk about advocacy, you know, um, you having to be your own advocate while dealing with breast cancer and going through that, you know, and that whole, just having to deal with that. And then now also because of this journey and the way that God works that now you wanna be a genetic counselor and you wanna do this to make sure that you, that other people have the same access. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and we are gonna do a, give a recap and a summary as well from the different breakout groups. So thank you all. Um, and uh, last but not least, Lakeisha, group five. And we'll oh, sorry, we will go over probably about 15 minutes. Hi, um, I'm, I see the time, so I'll be brief. I was in group five. It was, it was a small group. It was four of us, me, myself, I am myself, the, me, Sean, um, where's she at? Oh, Carrie Ann and Michelle. And I just briefly shared, you know, on my, my breast cancer diagnosis, how it started in 2011, early stage, stage one. 2019 progressed um, to metastatic disease. We we talked about how, you know, the insurance companies, how there's an issue with the insurance companies and 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 you know, getting medicine and how much it costs. Like, you know, my medicine that I'm currently on, well, my last medication is five thousand dollars a month, you know, and I was like, no, I who who can afford that? So then they're like, oh, you can't. Well, then I can, you know, refer you to the foundation and you can get it for free. So you could have always referred me to the foundation. It could have always been free, you know. Um, so we talked about that. We, we talked about the issues fighting with, you know, insurance companies to to get things approved in a timely manner so you can have your medications. We discussed. Carrie Ann discussed. Um, her, a little bit about her, her story and how she's in the Caribbean and the disparities, this, the, the disparities over there that she's dealing with and has to face. Um, Sean was in our group. And of course, he's already, you know, like the perfect person having a group because he knows everything. And he was able to chime in like for the medical aspect. And we had Michelle in our group. Um, so yeah, we did. It was, you know, it was a small group. And that's pretty much what we discussed. I'm trying to hurry up because I see it's after 11. So yeah. It's okay, because I want you to have your time as well, even if it's after 11, it's, but yes, and also to respect everyone else's time, but thank you, Temi, for sharing that um, and sharing about your session and um, what you guys discussed during that time. Um, it's so important. Sorry, Lakeisha, I just called you okay. um, yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, for yes, sharing that. Um, I would like to just thank everyone, and I also wanted to um, give uh, Sean, an opportunity after hearing, um, you know, the, from the different breakout sessions, if there's anything that you would like to add um, or, you know, some takeaways, suggestions or whatever as we um, wrap up today. Yeah, no, thank you again so much, everybody, for sharing your story and your experiences. And I think one thing um, that came out of our group that I always kind of, again, have to do a better job of reminding myself um, of is we had a member in our group, Carrie Ann, who was talking about her experience in Barbados and um, anything that is wrong in the US, we were kind of talking about the, the interesting thing about healthcare is that again, as opposed to other systems in the US, healthcare in the US actually does affect other countries, right? Like we develop drugs, we price drugs. And so all of these issues in the US are actually a lot worse than a lot of other countries as well. And so I think the same way that we say socioeconomic disparities are always like worse racial disparities. Racial disparities are also always worse globally as well. Um, and so I think that's just another thing to really sort of think about in all these conversations and center as well are the experience of people um, outside the US and sort of how the system is is even more broken um, in some other places. And so that that was uh, just like really, I think really powerful again to hear. Um, 
And yeah, I just think one thing that came up in our group is the fact that like this stuff is all, it's insane. Like it's lunacy. And I think that's the way that you get out of that like frog in the boiling water mentality where you just get used to stuff being $5,000 and 50% of bankruptcies in the US being because of medical costs. Like the way to not get used to that and complacent is to hear patient stories. And I think hear how pissed off people are and hear how sort of ridiculous this is to people who aren't in the system. So I just want to reiterate how powerful like these stories and these voices are when it comes to talking to people. Again, either it's your providers, if it's SAP, CS, if it's ASCO, whoever, um, because we all, and I, again, I say we, cause I, I kind of like am on this like path now, we get used to it. Like we just get used to this being the normal. I was raised in a medical system where we charge patients thousands of dollars for drugs. So um, I can't, I think overstate how important um, just the emotional side of this and the feelings in, in sort of like that outrage can be. And the other thing is that all of this is political. So I would just put a plug. I don't need to tell anybody in here to vote because we all know the statistics, um, but this stuff is all absolutely political, right? So everything we talk about, whether it's Medicare for all, for the ACA, um, this stuff is really intricately tied together. Um, and so I, that I would say uh, is actually a huge lever to, to pull because um, there's a lot of excitement around there, but we don't often think about these sort of like granular issues and specific diseases in the same way. Thanks, Sean. Let's get political. That's, <laughs> I just wrote that in the comments. <laughs> I am amped, hype, like, what's up? Let's do this. Um, like Nadia said, and I wrote in the comments too, I keep hearing the word fight um, and in different ways that the tone of the word fight, whether it's a fight as in a struggle, but fight also as being empowered and ready to push the needle forward. Um, but yes, you know, we are not accepting, we're, no, we're not accepting the status quo and we're not accepting the way that things are. Um, and like Charles said, this is about it isn't this is about a right and wrong. This is just about being a human and treating human beings with love, treating the golden rule, treat others as you like to be treated. It's very simple, um, but the mo it seems like the simpler it is, the more complicated it is, and that shouldn't be the case. So um, I just want to thank you all for your time. Um, I know that we have. I'm going to get ten minutes, so I want to give five minutes to open it up to um, our registrants, those participants who um, were a part of it. If you wanna share anything, um, thoughts, comments, uh, before we just have some closing remarks. I just wanna open the floor to anyone who would like to say um, anything before we wrap up. Okay, wanted to give you all that space to do so. Um, okay, so as um, thank you all so much for uh, coming uh, to this, participating, your voice and your presence here is so important and it has a ripple effect and an impact. Um, we continue to move this forward, this conversation. Um, we are going to take a hiatus and not um, since next month is December, um, you know, and this is the holidays and all of that, but we will be, um, you know, returning in January with more speakers, um, more conversations, and um, I think we also may need to have a group. We need to have our own um, collective outside of this that we can um, come together and really talk about how we wanna move legislation and get political about that. It's definitely, um, I'm receiving that from everyone. So uh, thank you all for this. Um, I'm I also like, going, I, like I wanna- to sponsor, I'd like oh. to sponsor the next group, uh, Shauna. So I'll reach out because yeah. uh, this has been fat to, you know, and I think, you know, I'll tell you more about my organization and why I'm specifically here, but I want to respond to the next one. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. This, see, if you, yes, I, yeah, thank you so much. That is just really meaningful. And it just goes to show, I mean, immediately how things can change and how things like a ripple effect. That's it right there. It just happened. Call action. Boom. Let's keep it going. So thank you. So much for that. Um, I also wanted to offer uh, and just give a, a reminder or share in the um, to everyone that's on the call that Tiger Lily Foundation is going to have um, a, we have a prayer circle. Patricia, can you just put, add everything in the chat for me because I, I have to scroll up. Um, but we are going to have a prayer circle on Sunday. Uh, that is a non-denominational prayer service. We have usually it's on a monthly basis. And we are having one to honor Shante Randall, who, who we lost last week. Um, and so if you'd like to come there also even for individual prayers or just to, um, you know, you'd like to be a part of that, the Zoom link is in the chat. Um, and uh, it is, Patricia, what time is it on Sunday? 
can you just let us know? Or you can Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. This has been such an amazing time. So the call on Sunday is going to be, um, I believe, at 730. Um, so registration will end uh, Sunday morning. Um, and it's, it's just holding space for an hour, uh, which, again, it's not denominational, just respecting everybody's um, perspective of how they perceive God in their relationship um, and just understanding that there's empowerment when we do prayer and meditation in, in large numbers. Um, and it, again, it will be um, honoring our dear sister and um, there will be a, an opportunity to um, also make a, a live prayer request. So if you're interested, um, I'm going to share on my Instagram page and you can also visit Tiger Lily's page um, to learn more about it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the gist of the information. Thank you, Patricia. And um, if you would like to uh, get in contact with the women that are on this call, these phenomenal women, I would just ask um, all of our speakers if you could just drop your Instagram handle and slash or your email address if you would like um, for participants to registrants to reach out to you. And um, we'll also share that privately with you guys if you like that information, but please put it in the comments, drop how they can follow you. Um, we have organizations here, like Tova said, she is the founder of Pretty Stick. Check her out. We wanna amplify those women who are on here who are doing incredible things. Um, Latalia is an incredible speaker as you heard just from you know, coach, life coach, phenomenal. Please check her out. Um, Lakeisha and uh, Pink Shoes. Um, Temi is about to blow up with her genetic counseling. Like we, there's so many advocates on here. Uh, so please make sure to follow, support, um, sponsor, amplify these women. Uh, we are stronger together and there is space for all of us. And so, um, yes, please. Yes, Nadia is pretty fit survivor. Yes, Nadia, thank you. Um, and yes, if you want to put your websites in there as well. And thank you guys. And I'm going to wrap it up and close it off. So have a wonderful, blessed uh, week. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thankful for each one of you. Have a lovely holiday season, whether that's Christmas, or whatever. And um, God willing, we will see everyone in the new year. Yes. So bye-bye. Thank you all.